Today we're going to talk about the myths, legends, and cannibals of the Fiji Islands. And this is for those of you who really didn't get enough in the last cannibalism lecture. Uh, so we're, we're going to cover a little bit more in how cannibalism is specific to Fiji. I'll give you the heads up when we're about to hit the uh, cannibalism chapter, so in case any of you uh, feel the need to leave, you certainly have the time to do so. Fiji was settled around 3500 BC to 1000 BCE by the Austronesian peoples. And then the Melanesian peoples came in around about the time of Christ, about 2000 years ago. So what we're going to see in this island is, is two or three successive waves of peopling. The first by the Austronesian people, later by the Melanesians, and then later on we're going to see the Polynesian influence in this culture. So Fiji is really unique. It's considered a Melanesian island, but it's located kind of within the Polynesian Triangle, as you see from New Zealand going up to Hawaii over to Easter Island and back over again. They kind of do a jog around Fiji to exclude it from the Polynesian Triangle, but if you do a direct line, it's included directly within the Polynesian Triangle, and it does have a number of the cultural elements that you'll find throughout Polynesia, particularly Tongan and Samoan societies, as well as Melanesian society. From Fiji, the Lapita culture, many of you have heard of the Lapita culture and their pottery. When you were in Tonga, there was probably a few of the guides who probably told you that Tonga was the birthplace of Polynesian culture. And they're right to a certain extent, except that Fiji was really the first stop. It was from Fiji that these first peoples who would become Polynesian, the Lapita culture, left Fiji and then went to the Samoas and went to Tonga. And this is where Polynesian culture evolved, was in Tonga and Samoa. So the Melanesians erased all evidence and all memory of the people that came before them. And then they mixed later on with the Polynesians. So what we'll see in Fiji is that there's a strong connection to Melanesian society. From the skin color, you'll see some of the traditions, but you'll also notice, now that you've been to a few of the Polynesian islands, you'll see in the way that they dress, you'll see in the way that they look in some, uh, in some respects, and also in the words and uh, in some of their cultural traditions, you'll see similarities with Polynesia. So it's a very, very interesting syncretic mix of both Melanesian and Polynesian culture. Trade between Fiji and the neighboring archipelagos was common long before European contact. In fact, they have found canoes in Tonga that were made from wood in Fiji. So either the Fijians brought the trees over to Tonga and the canoes were made, or people from Fiji actually brought the canoes made of this wood from Fiji over to Tonga. So you can see how long these trips must have been. Uh, although you can see some of the islands as we travel now, if you're looking out, you see some small islands, that the people would have been able to do some island hopping in between uh, Tongan, Samoa, and Fiji. Pots made in Fiji have also been found in Samoa and also in the Marquesas Islands. So we see this evidence of cultural uh, interchange well before European contact. In the 10th century, the Tuitonga Empire reached as far out as Fiji. So in a very similar respect to, for those of you who are, who are students of, of Greek and Roman culture, you know that the, um, the Greeks were the first ones to really populate the area around Napoli and Rome, and then the Etruscans came, and then the Romans then developed their culture and then went back over to, to conquer over in Greece. So you see Hadrian's Arch over in Athens and you'll see some of the, the Greek culture that influenced the Etruscans which later re influenced Roman culture. In the same way here you see that the Fijians went to Tonga first and then the Tongans developed their culture and came back and brought that culture all the way back to Fiji. So some of the Tongan influence uh, you can see today in the language and the uh, customs in Fiji. And this 
uh, empire, the, the Tongatui Empire, began to decline around about the 13th century. So about the same time that Polynesians were arriving in New Zealand, this Tonga uh, culture was actually starting to decline. F Fijian society is very much hierarchical. Leaders were chosen according to rank, which was based on lineage, as well as personal achievement. So while it was important to understand the family that you were born into, uh, and that your family was very significant in where you ended up in society, you could also change your stars. You could be a person of a, a warrior, you could be an artist, you could be a priest, and change your rank within traditional Fijian society. The Fijians uh, had a, a network of alliances that either kept the peace or brought tribes against each other in war. And uh, warfare among these tribes was quite common. And they're very happy to talk about their warring history. The Fijians are a warring culture, and they're happy to admit and to talk about their dominance uh, and their roles as a warrior culture. There are some really interesting taboos that you'll find in Fiji regarding family roles and how people interact and connect with one another. Social interaction among families and close tribes between brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles is very detailed and it's complicated. Uh, there are books written about the roles uh, that, uh, within Fijian society and how one is to respond to other people in your family. The Fijian concept of family is very different from our own. So in our, level, in our society, in a family, you would have children and you would be expected to care for and raise your children. In Fijian society, it's much less based on the genealogy and much more on the child's link to a spiritual ancestor. So if the child is named, say, maybe after a great-grandfather or a great-uncle, the uncle's family might play more of a significant role in that child's life. Or if, as this child is growing up, they see some similarities, perhaps, in how this child speaks and how this child acts, maybe with a deceased relative, the family of that deceased relative might start to play a more significant role in how that child is raised. So it's a very fluid relationship among families, and it's extended among many members of the extended family. There's a system of kinship that plays an important role, and so it, it Basically, it, uh, it talks about the ways people interact with each other inside the family unit. And there are respect and avoidance roles in every one of these cultures. For example, boys and girls at the age of uh, 13 or 14 are separated. This, you'll see, is very common throughout Polynesian society. This happens uh, even in Tongan society. Less so today because of the, the cultural mores are changing, becoming much more westernized. Uh, but even until recent times, uh, if you were in Tonga and you were, with your, you were a, a boy and you were out with your female cousins and her friends, if you were going into a party, the girl would go inside and the boy would wait in the car. He wouldn't go inside of that party because there was an avoidance relationship that you were expected not to have any sort of physical contact or to be close with any of your female cousins of a similar age. And of course, this was meant to protect the family lines to ensure that there wasn't any problems with, uh, with having sexual relationships and then babies born into these tribes. Uh, so there was all of these avoidance laws and rituals that were put into place. In Fijian society, it's largely based on age and rank and sex and social distance between each other. So an older person, the older a person is, the greater their rank, regardless of the, the, uh, of the sex of the person. Men, however, are respected above women. So if you are an older man in Fijian society, you have the highest level of respect. And if you're a young girl, you have the lowest level of respect inside of Fijian society. That being said, a older woman in Fijian society would have a greater level of respect and ranking in society than, say, a middle-aged man. So people who interact with one another on a regular basis may not have such strict bonds, may not have such strict uh, r rules and requirements that 
outline how they're supposed to act with each other. But let's say that you haven't seen your great aunt or your uncle or your grandfather maybe comes from a different island. There is a very specific set of guidelines and rules and respect that you offer this grandfather. And in many respects, it's very similar to our own society, isn't it? When we think about for those relatives that you're close with, you're really on a first name basis with them. You see them more often, you don't maybe offer the same level of respect as you, that, that you uh, might offer someone you haven't seen more, uh, that you haven't seen in a while. But uh, gosh, if you haven't seen your grandmother or your grandfather in 15 years, there's a distance that's automatic there. And this is also part of their society, but it's, it's not implied as it is in ours. It's very much a regulated part of how they interact with each other in society. So people who, see, who do not see each other as often, who are less familiar with each other, have to follow very strict rules for uh, social guidelines. We'll talk briefly about some of the ceremonies, but in Fijian ceremonies, the Fijian ceremonies are held really for, for three reasons, birth, death, and marriage. And traditionally speaking, birthdays are not necessarily celebrated in Fijian culture. They simply don't make a big deal about celebrating birthdays, but there are some people within Fijian culture who do have their birthdays celebrated. The first birthday of the firstborn child is celebrated and has a great deal of ritual that goes along with it. The father of the child, his family will bring in mats. And what you'll see is that these mats are very, very important because these are the mats that they place on their wooden floors. And these are the mats that they will eat their meals on, that they will sleep on, that they will have all of their family gatherings on these mats. So the father's side will bring the mats for the celebration. And then after the party, the mother's side then removes the mats and then guards those, uh, they go to different members of the family to be guarded so that later on, this child has then presented those mats that were presented to him uh, or her on their first birthday. And in, for informal, formal engagement, a person might receive a sperm whale tooth. Seems intuitive, right? Sperm whale tooth for an engagement. It's known as a taboo, and a man, instead of giving an engagement ring, a man would give a woman a necklace made out of this tabua, this uh, sperm whale's tooth. And it's, as you've learned already, it comes from the word tabu or tapu, which means sacred, right? And so this is associated with sacred. It's meant to convey the supernatural or good luck. And in other respects, it's also meant to communicate and to seal a bond. Right now, these sperm whale teeth can be very, very expensive. There was one in a shop, in an art shop that uh, was in uh, Papiete that wasn't even for sale because they can't be sold anymore because of international law. But in some societies, particularly in Fiji, you can buy them, and some of them are several thousand dollars. Uh, some of the older ones that have some of the ancient carvings on them can be worth quite a lot of money. So despite the fact that uh, giving, uh, that these are expensive and the fact that it's really only done in, uh, in really outside of the main city areas, it's still very much a part of Fijian culture. It's not really practiced so much within the cities. They will now give rings, Western society has taken over. So the diamond ring in many parts of Fijian society has replaced this. Uh, but noble families still keep a cachet of these sperm whale teeth for the time that when their son gets married, he has a trove of these that he's able to provide and provide as kind of a dowry to the, to the woman's family. In addition to engagement, taboos are also given at weddings, funerals, and births, and to seal an apology. So in this respect, a taboo is really meant to seal an agreement. So if you're getting married, what you're saying is, will you marry me? And you're giving this gift as a sign of your commitment. And then the person receives it, accepting your commitment, accepting your promise. The same way at funerals and births, people come to leave these as a sign of their honor and respect. And it's really a gift for the family, this currency that can be used uh, and continue the circle of giving throughout their society. The greater number of teeth that a person gives, the greater the gift. And when you give the gift, no matter how many gifts you're giving of, these, uh, of the tabuas, 
Your role is to downplay this. It's to say, oh, I wish I could have given more. I'm sorry that it's so many. Even if you're giving 50 or 100, your role is to downplay this gift. And the person who's receiving this gift, your role is to play it up to say, oh, this is incredibly generous. We're so grateful. This is going to change the future of our family. We're so indebted to you. What can we, and so it's this back and forth that's very flowerful language, and it's meant to be an exchange of eloquence and humility. It's meant to show each other that we respect each other, and that as others are listening, they are also learning, children are learning the ways in which we speak, the ways in which we craft agreements, and the ways in which we honor these important moments in our lives, the births, the deaths, the marriages, and these other important moment, moments in our lives. And very importantly, to seal an apology. So during the days of warring tribes be, before uh, uh, European influence, if a chief wanted to kill someone, but was unable to do it himself, he would offer a tabua to another tribe to take care of the matter. So really it is, again, it's this idea. If he gives it, it's payment. If they accept it, they've sealed the deal. They're now in an agreement that this is what's going to happen for this price. And it becomes an agreement between those two people. This, however, happened in the 19th century with Reverend Thomas Baker, who uh, had offended one of the tribal chiefs. And so the tribal chief recognized that he couldn't do the killing himself. So he offered the job to another tribe. And this Reverend Baker was killed uh, because he had offended the tribal chief. Well, in 2003, the tribe presented the family, the descendants of uh, Thomas Baker, with 100 of these tabuas. And you can imagine their response what am I going to do with these? Particularly after they learned that each one of these taboos was worth roughly three to $4,000 each, and they had received over 100 of them. And of course, they couldn't do anything but hold on. Some of them were donated and given away. But th uh, the reason that they were given was because the people from the family thought that they had been cursed for all of these generations. Employ uh, unemployment was very high. They weren't getting their government benefits in a timely manner. So they thought, hey, how does this make sense? This, we're, getting un you know, we're being impacted here in an unreasonable way. Ah, it must be because our family line killed this reverend uh, back 150, 200 years ago. And so there's actually a great article about it online. You can read about it. There was uh, many dignitaries came uh, from the, the family came all the way over from England, and there were many dignitaries from Fijian society that came out uh, to be a part of this. Marriage is an important uh, social tradition within Fiji. Arranged marriages are rarely practiced nowadays in Fiji, although due to some of the Indian cultures, there are still some uh, arranged marriages, but that's mostly on the Indian side, not so much on the Fijian side. However, a marriage could be arranged by the man's, man's parents or senior members of the tribe back in the old days to align not only the husband and the wife, but to align the two tribes together. So marriage was rarely about two individuals. As we see through the Middle Ages and through many societies, European societies included, marriage was often not done at the highest level. You, you, only the, the peasants and the lower class peoples were able to marry for love. Most of the people who were the nobles, the dignitaries, the kingly families, they married to join kingdoms. They married to join tribes. This is common throughout the clans of Scotland, throughout Britain, and throughout most of Europe, that these great families were bound together because of intermarriage. So this is still common uh, today on some levels, only among the most noble families. Uh, and marriage among two people for reasons of just love was almost never unheard of at the highest levels of society. Today, people marry for love, but still at some of the higher class, the noble castes, they're still marrying because of these unions and keeping families together. So marriage was often used to reinforce the tie between two groups or two tribes, and also to reinstate these bonds among tribes that had been separated over generations. What you'll see in Fiji is you'll see the repetition of words. 
the tevu tevu, you see bula bula. You'll hear the words repeated. This is kind of a common element, and you'll see it over the next uh, few slides here in this presentation. So if a protocol is followed, the tevu tevu is performed. It involves both sides of the families now presenting the couple with mats so that they can begin their new home. So a family will now have a home, but they will have very few pieces of furniture, and the mats become now the flooring. They become these ceremonial pieces that bind these, these couples together. And they're very important because these mats are held onto for a very long time. Eloping is more common, but it does cause a problem these days. Because if the, a couple elopes, they have to do a special ceremony called a bulubulu ceremony, which means to bury. And the reason for this is because the husband, when he elopes with his bride, has committed a theft of sorts. And so it's costly to do this bulubulu because you have to pay back the family that you've stolen the bride from. And so now the bride can't even go back to her village again until this price has been paid. So a young couple that elopes saves money in the short term, but ends up spending it back again in the long term. So uh, it's really this, this balance that's meant to show couples, please don't dismiss our traditions. Don't dismiss the marriage. It's important for everyone. And yes, you may save some money today, but you're going to have to pay it back. And you also have the embarrassment that you caused both families. So eloping is, is not recommended for, for Fijian couples. When a death occurs, related clans and family gather together and it's meant to, reaffirm, to share their sorrow and to reaffirm their communal connections. You'll see here the way these people dress is very similar to what you saw in Tonga as well. You'll see people wearing the black pants or the black skirts, and then they would have the, the flax or the, the, the small mat wrapped around them with a the belt. This is the same sort of tradition, so you can see these, these connections here among societies. The regu regu leads up to the burial where the friends and the family come to pay their respects. They'll again lay out the mats. They'll do the yakona ceremony. And then they do the tabu as well. So people will bring the sperm whale teeth. And this varies from, from province to province. After several days, the burial actually takes place at the grave site. And you can see here, this is how people are carrying them uh, in their mats. So they'll be wrapped in their family mats. So in some respects, the same mats that you were given as a child, as a baby on your first birthday, might be the same mat that you're wrapped in when you're placed in the grave. And then your family brings other mats and cloths to wrap around you. So there isn't the fanfare with the expensive coffins and these kinds of things, but they are placed in a grave site. And then it's a year later that the, uh, the grave site is cemented. It's uh, actually within a period of 100 days that the grave site is cemented in and then another ceremony is held a full year later. How many of you are going to be doing a visit to a village in Fiji? Okay, a few of you. They'll be doing, maybe some of you will be able to do the kava ceremony, which is the, uh, the drink of the yakona, the kava ceremony. It's a, a very important ceremony, and I'll show you a, a, a video in a little bit. But yakuna, yakona is actually kava, and it's from the pepper family, and it's a spicy sort of a... Um, earthy flavor that they mix with water, and it's kind of a hallucinogenic when, uh, when done in, in large amounts. So when the person is mixing this, as you'll see here in this photo, they'll sit cross-legged, and then he will say, And what that means is, I will respectfully mix the yakona for the chieftain. And then as he's mixing it, he's putting it up in the air, and so you're able to see just how the mixture is. And someone will say, why? Which is a question. They're saying, hey, more water, please. And then when it's the right mixture, they're going to say, why don't you? And then he knows that the, the Yakona is the perfect mix, and then he can start to serve it. So then the mixer cups his hands, and then he's going to be clapping his hands. The chief is the first one to drink, and then the others may drink. And it's this wonderful ceremony that is passed around, the cup is passed around person to person according to rank. And when you're welcomed into a Fijian village, this is often the ceremony that takes place. And here's a brief video to show you the Yakona ceremony. Cowboys are what is drink in Fiji. 
this hundreds of years from the, our, our, our ancestors until now and still continue. After work, like, yeah. you know, like a bottle of wine, go to the pub, have a beer, yeah. then go home. Same thing in Fiji. After work, like we're gathering together with a bottle of cup, cup Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Then go home, then have dinner and sleep. This is a root. They can take uh, three hours or two hours to uproot the, the, the plant. And after that, you can wash it nicely in the fresh water. Then you put it in the sun to dry. After this, then you pound it into powder. So this is how it comes up to after we pound it into cover. The pound is going to mix it with the water. So after this, we'll show you how to mix the cover. You can see now we put the cover inside the cloth, which is the water which is already in the cover bowl. You can see the water, the water changes into color. That's the really color of the, of the cover, it's brown. Uh, sometimes they say it's, it's, uh, they say it's muddy. Is it like alcohol? No, this one is like make you feel mellow. It's like marijuana? Yeah, it's like you feel high. And no tongue should be lang, 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 lang. <laughs> Wait, what was that? <laughs> Your tongue should be lang, lang. They make you sleep well at night. And you have a few dreams. Now we'll try to serve the cover. It's a crap one. How does it taste? It tastes uh, earthy, like uh, soil. Yeah, like soil and, and spicy, and it, it numbs, it tingles on your throat and tongue. Are you feeling the effects, the relaxing effects yet? I don't think not yet. How long does it take? Six to seven bowls. Six to seven bowls. Yeah. All right. Do you want to try some? <laughs> yeah, I'll try. You can feel it, eh? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of in a zone right now. I'm, uh, I'm catching a vibe for sure. What? You feel it? What? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> what? Tell me. It's okay. <laughs> I like it after six of these you're gonna really start feeling it yeah. i'm a lightweight i can already feel it <laughs> <laughs> i like it soothing so after drink you have to smile <laughs> so when I lived in, in Fiji almost 30 years ago, you can actually see a picture of me in the far corner there. I'm the white guy, obviously. Um, I was about 150 pounds, uh, so about the same size as my, my son is right now, six foot two and 150 pounds. And um, I was actually welcomed, and we had the Yakona ceremony, and uh, I lost count of how many bowls I drank after about 23. And so they carried me to, back to my house where I was staying, and I slept so soundly, I didn't get up. I went to bed at around midnight, and I didn't get up until almost noon the next day. They had to wake me because they were having a lunch in my honor. So they had to wake me. I was still sleeping yet. And all I can tell you is I must have gone to the bathroom for what seemed like 15 minutes straight. I consumed so much of this Yakona, and I had slept so soundly, I can't ever remember such a sound sleep. But when I was welcomed into this village, uh, it was such a wonderful feeling because you come into the house and you're welcomed by your family. And as soon as I walked in, the father of the house, when I walked in the, the front door, he walked out the back. And he had a ceremonial whale hook that's a, a hook that was made out of a whale, similar to what you'll find in many of the little shops, you'll see this little hook. And this is common throughout Polynesia. And so during my welcome, he went out as I was being welcomed with the family and having biscuits and tea. He took that whale bone hook and he cast, went out in his boat and he was casting for a fish. 
and he caught a fish, and that was the fish that I ate on my first night in Fiji. So he came back and he brought me this fish and he showed me that he had caught this in my honor. And then he gave me the fish hook that I could have that. And it's such a wonderful memory and such a wonderful tradition to make people feel welcome, to know that they had gone out and done this just for me and that I alone would be the one who would have that, that fish. It, it wasn't quite as comforting when I found out that the rest of the people were having crab that night. But Nonetheless, I felt quite honored. As you can see here with the welcome lunch, these were the, the welcome lunch. You can see all the mats laid out on the floor and they put the, the, the leaves, the banana leaves, and they'll put their cloths out and they'll put all their food out. So as I got to this lunch, we're sitting around and we're talking and everyone is lined up like this and talking and waiting. And five minutes went by, we kept on talking and 10 minutes and then 15 minutes. And in about 20 minutes, I, I said to my, the guy sitting next to me, I said, hey, how come no one's eating? And he said, they're waiting for you to start. So I ended up having to, as soon as I put my hand in and took out the first piece of chicken, the whole family went in for it. It was very funny. And I realized then, you know, I was very young, I was 21, that I had to be aware of my social environment, that I had to ask people what was expected of me because when you're a guest, it's not just about being there, it's about knowing what was expected of me in that moment and I had failed and kept all of these people waiting. And imagine these poor kids waiting 20 minutes for this white guy to shut up and start eating and I, and I didn't know. So uh, you can see here, uh, this was uh, my family that I stayed with on the left. And um, when I left, I gave uh, Cordell, as the young, young man there, he was only 16 at the time, I gave him my red Swiss army knife and he'd never seen anything like it before. So he wanted to do something special for me. So he went out and dug up a banana plant and then got another special type of banana that he liked and he grafted them together and he called this Patrick Banana. So someplace uh, in Fiji, I have a banana named after me. I'm, I'm hoping it's good. Uh, and you can see here the mat gift that they gave me, this beautiful hat, and a mat that I still have in my office today, some 30 years later. Uh, and someday I'll pass that mat down to my children, but it's, it's still very, very important to me today. And you can see that we wore the, the Sulus, which were wrapped around the entire time that we were there. We had our underwear on underneath, but we all wore the, even the men wore the Sulus uh, as a sign of respect in the village. Oop. One of the things that was really interesting for me is that in these Fijian tribes, particularly in the outside of area, this was before cell phones and before a lot of these places had television signals, once a month they would send a representative from the tribe to go into town, into Suva, and to watch the movie, to see what was playing in the movie theater. And it was a sign of honor that you were selected to be the one to go in to watch the movie. And I never quite understood this until we went in to watch a movie. And the reason it was important is because this was the only time that they got to hear the news. About an hour and a half to two hours before the movie starts, everyone is there and I'm thinking, we're really early for this movie. I generally show up just in time to get popcorn and some soda and they were there two hours in advance. And we got inside and reel after reel of the local news was playing from Australia, from Britain, from the United States. And so you saw all these people these people of different ages were all taking notes inside of this movie theater because they were the ones that were entrusted to not only watch the movie and tell them about the movie, but they had to take back all of the notes about what was happening in the world. And the father of the house that I was staying at told me about the time that he had to be the messenger of this bad news bringing back to his family in Fiji because the Fijians had always thought that they were going to be the ones who would lasso and bring down the moon. So they actually have in small, they have the, the saplings and they will tie a rope to it and at the full moon, when the moon is closest to the earth, or appears closest, they would cut this and they thought that they could lasso the moon and pull it down, it was a tradition. And so this man, at the age of 22, had to tell his family that the Americans had landed on the moon. And imagine being the messenger of that news. This tribe and this entire village had thought that they were going to be the ones who were going to lasso the moon until they found out that these Americans had landed on the moon with their spacecraft. 
So very interesting, and, and I've never forgotten that. And I, every time I go to a movie, I think, man, uh, imagine those people, how important it was only once a month that they would be able to get their news from these people who went to the movie theaters. We'll talk a little bit about the myths of Fiji. The role of serpents in religious history is an interest one, interesting one. For many of you, you're aware of uh, the role of, of, the, uh, of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And most iterations of the serpent throughout mythology have negative connotations. They're roles of evil. However, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest stories ever recorded, and it predates the Hebrew scriptures, Gilgamesh loses the power of immortality because it's stolen by a snake. For those of you who have done some biblical work, you'll understand that parts of the Hebrew scriptures, they believe, scholars believe that there's modeled on the epic of Gilgamesh. And so here we hear the story of Gilgamesh losing the power of immortality. And in the Hebrew scriptures, we see that man is mortal and the serpent wants them to eat, to eat from the tree of of um, life so that he, and God didn't want them to eat from the tree of life so that they wouldn't have immortality. So they were mortal and he didn't want them to be immortal. So interesting differences. Oruboros is an ancient symbol of a serpent eating its own tail that represents the cycle of life, death, rebirth, and then life all over again. In Hinduism and Buddhism, this is called samsara. It's the cycle of life, death, rebirth, and then it's this reimagining in a new body, but the soul, the Atman, remains the same, and what changes is the physical representation. In Genesis, in Revelation, the serpent played an important role, but it also played an important role in the religious, literal, uh, religious and cultural life of Egypt, Canaan, Mesopotamia and Greece. The serpent was a symbol of underworld evil power as well as a, uh, a symbol of fertility, life, and of healing. For those of you who have read the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Nahas, the sea Hebrew for snake, is also associated with divination and fortune telling. So in the Hebrew Bible, Nahas identifies the serpent in the garden of, in garden of evil. And there's two different types of serpents that are important to understand. It was also used in conjunction with seraph. So for those of you who understand seraphim, a seraphim is a type of celestial or heavenly beating that was originated by the Jews in their scriptures. But a seraph is known as the burning one or the serpent. And so this idea of seraphim comes from that. The tannin is a dragon monster which also occurs throughout the Bible. So for those of you who have read the book of Exodus, you'll hear that Moses and Aaron had their staffs turned into, stake, in, into snakes. Well, Moses... Uh, his staff was turned into a Nahas, which was a serpent. And Aaron's was turned into a Tanan, which was a dragon. And so the words are different. We hear it today and we read it and we see the same word for snake. But in the original scriptures, there are two different beings for two different types of creatures and two significant, two different sig significant roles. So in the story of the Garden of Eden, the fall of man is represented here. This is represented for the Abrahamic peoples. There's, there's a moral tale that's to be told here. We understand that the serpent is portrayed as deceptive and cunning, and he's trying to pull people away from doing the work of God. But in these original tellings of the story, it wasn't necessarily understood as an evil being. It was only really in, through Christianity that the, that the serpent became an evil creature, and I'll explain why. In the Genesis and creation story, God placed Adam in the garden to tend it and warned him not to eat from the tree of knowledge, saying that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt die. So if you eat from the tree of knowledge, you would die. Well, the serpent tempted Eve, and then Eve took a bite. And the serpent said, if you take a bite of this apple, your eye shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. And so in the early story, the question becomes, God said that you would die if you ate it. The serpent said, you won't die, but you will know good from evil. They listened to the serpent, they ate from the tree, they didn't die, and they learned good from evil. So in the earliest stories, it was meant that the serpent is actually like a guide person who's guiding them to understand that God 
had set out for them something not to do, but they needed to think for themselves. And much like at adolescence, they were pushing away. And so the woman now guides Adam to know good from evil. And it was only later on then in the story when we find out that now God wanted them to be removed from the Garden of Eden because he didn't want them eating from the tree of life where they would become immortal. And so this is an important distinction. They ate from the tree of wisdom to know good from evil, but God didn't want them to eat from the tree of life so that they would not become immortal. And so this is in contrast to the story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. And so in, Christian, in traditional Christianity, the connection is then made between the serpent and Satan. And it says here, and the Lord God said to the serpent, because thou hast done this, you shall be cursed. Well, you were already a serpent, so you're already on your belly, but you shall eat dust all the days of your life, and then I will put enmity between you and the, the children of Adam. Now, the Fijian story has Ndege, the serpent god, and this is one of the only stories in all of mythology around the world that has this interesting serpent god who is not only a god, but he's the supreme God. He's the creator God. And so he's believed to be the creator of the Fiji Islands and the one that judges souls and decides where the souls are going to go after they die. This all sounds familiar, doesn't it? Thousands of years of difference, and yet what we see here is these same symbols are being used to show and we, we talk about God in the same context, the God who judges us and decides when we die and where our souls go after we die. And according to the legend, there was a bird, uh, the Turukawa, who laid two eggs. And now we see this difference. We have the serpent on the earth and the Turukawa in the air, right? And so we have the two differences represented here. We have the earth and then we have the spirit realm, the physical and the spirit realm. And so Turukawa gives birth, or she actually lays, uh, lays a nest, lays eggs in the nest. And it's from these eggs that the serpent then takes them, gathers them, keeps them warm. He incubates them. And then when these eggs are hatched, they are hatched as human beings. And those became his children. So here we see Turukawa, the sky god, lays the eggs of the two humans, and the earth snake then gathers them, keeps them warm, incubates them, and gives birth to these two human beings which became his children. And so he kept his children separate. He fed them from banana and the taro root, but they could only eat the banana because the taro root needed to be cooked. And the method of fire now is explained so that the humans grew up. They asked Ndege, to show them how to harness the power of fire so that they, they could eat the food of the gods. In the Garden of Eden, we have the snake showing them how to eat from the tree of wisdom, the tree of life. And here, we have the humans now asking Ndege to show them how to create fire so that they can eat the food of the gods. And Ndege taught them. And after a while, Ndege went to live on his... The, went to live on his own, and his human children went to live on their own. And the story is important here because he says, Ndege wasn't upset. He wasn't a jealous God. He wasn't upset that his children went off and did their own thing because he knew that his children and their children would worship him forever as their God. So no jealousy. And again, we see this difference and through the Hebrew scriptures. We hear that Yahweh is a jealous God. And here, this is meant very specifically to say that this isn't a jealous God. So this myth is one of the few that represents the serpent God as one that is good and not evil. And according to the legends, the serpent God Ndege now lives in the cave in the Nakavadra mountain in Vitilevo in Fiji. So when you see the mountain, you can actually see that that's where Ndege lives today. Now the moment you've all been waiting for, cannibalism. So the lack of adequate nutrition forced sailors when they were sailing to eat the dead in order to survive. And so when these people landed in Fiji, cannibalism became part of their diet. And in time, this act took on greater meaning. So what we understand today is that they were eating people as a necessity while they traveled. And then when they came to Fiji and they stayed there, 
They wanted to continue this act of cannibalism, and so they created opportunities, rites, and rituals, and beliefs that would allow them and give greater meaning to the act of cannibalism. So they had the act, and then they created a religion and rituals and rites to be able to allow them to continue this act without shame. Cannibalism was used for insult and as a sacrifice. Eating human flesh was an insult and a vengeance beyond the grave. It was an ultimate insult for society based upon ancestral worship. So if you worshiped your ancestors, and the spirit realm is right above your head, so whenever you enter a Fijian home, everyone is sitting down, you have to walk in like this when you walk into a Fijian home. Because if you walk up straight like this, you're now occupying the spirit world. And you have to bow down low so that you're not interfering with the spirit world. And their ancestors are all around them at all times. However, if your ancestors were killed and eaten, their spirit was eaten and now is a part of a living human being. And that spirit power has now been destroyed. And so you've not only destroyed the person, you've also destroyed the ability for, the f for future generations to remember and to have access to this person in the spirit world. So you've insulted the family and generations and you've deprived them of access to their relative for future generations. Conquered enemies were eaten. However, slaves, shipwrecked sailors, or those from a lower caste were also eaten. So in many circumstances, we find here that they were creating whatever reason they needed to continue the act of cannibalism. They also required human sacrifice at certain times. So when a house was being built, built a temple, a chief's house, when a sacred canoe was being dedicated, or the installation rites of a new chief, obviously someone has to be killed and eaten. So this is all part of this, that they created rituals and chants to keep this act of cannibalism going. Bodies of the victims were dragged to the priest's house and were kept alive, and the death drum was played. Men performed a, dance, a, a, a death dance, and the women performed an obscene dance that was often very sexually abusive, physically abusive. They would cut them, they would beat them. Some of them, they would take off all of their clothes. Some of them would, would simulate sex with them, whether it would be a corpse. Many of the times they would keep this person alive and they would severely torture them before killing them. So it wasn't just about the eating of the flesh. It allowed them somehow to be a part of a very animalistic ritual. If the war had been, or a war or a raid had been particularly successful, they would bring back on their canoes dead children hanging from the masts of the ship. They would hang them by their heels. And when they would return, they would take all the bodies that they had killed and they'd throw them at the feet of the chief. And then they would, the chief would thank them and this would be a sacrifice to the gods. The heads of the victims were hit against a braining stone and the sacrifice would then be the sacrificing of the brain to the god, to the war god. While the victims were being cooked, the warriors continued their death dance, and the women continued their sexual dancing, culminating in a frenzied sexual orgy. So what would happen, they'd get them all self, with them all worked up, the women would take off all their clothes and start dancing, the men would be doing their dance, and they'd work themselves up, and before dinner, let's have an orgy. And that's what would happen. And women consented to sex with warrior after warrior after warrior. It was here, it didn't matter what the, any of the social implications might be. Everyone was sharing, this was one of these, these social community uh, events uh, that I think probably everyone looked forward to. Here was an account from a uh, particularly wild orgy. That night was spent in eating and drinking in obscenity. The blood drank and the flesh eating seemed to have a maddening effect on the warriors. I had often seen men killed and eaten, but I never saw or heard such a night as that. Next morning, many of the poor women were unable to move from the continuous connections of the maddened warriors. And that's about as much of that tale as I can read you. So during the wars or on the field of battle, armies and war par parties generally ate the bodies of their victims on the field of battle. And this wasn't done with any sort of circumstance. It was only done in circumstance when in fact a chief was killed. And if a chief was killed on the field of battle, 
his manner was strong. If he had been a strong warrior, a strong chief, they would cut out his heart and they would eat his heart and they would be passed around so that his mana, his spiritual power, would be passed to all of the other members of the, of the victors. And then they would cut his throat and they would drink his blood so that all of his blood would be coursing through their veins, the, the blood of the victor and all of his spiritual power. But if the chief was a bad man, if he was an evil man, or if he did things that were un, uh, dishonorable, they would kill him, feed his body to the dogs, kill the dogs, and then burn the dogs so that his karma, his, his mana, would never again be present to any human being. It was a way of eliminating this type of evil. So very interesting. During wartime, the skull of the defeated chief was used as a kava bowl. So we talked about using the coconut, right, for the kava bowl. Imagine now, after battle, you've won this entire battle, and you've killed the chief, and now you have the chief's head, you've carved out his skull, and now you're having the Yakona ceremony, and you're sitting on the other side is the defeated tribe's family, the family of the chief, now forced to drink kava from the head of their father, their husband, or of their chief. It was the ultimate defeat that was uh, pushed upon them. Some of the cannibals, uh, one of the great cannibal chiefs in 18, uh, 1827, was said to have uh, kept his victims alive to fatten them. He was not in the habit of sacrificing his prisoners immediately, finding them perhaps too tough for his delicate stomach, but of actually ordering, ordering them to be operated on and put in such a state as to get both fat and tender, afterwards to be killed as he might want them. In the highlands of Fiji, the bones of victims were placed in the V's of trees. So you can see here in the forks of trees, you can see how these bones were stacked up. That was meant as a reminder that you were coming into cannibal territory and to be careful of what you said and what you did and to not be there if you weren't meant to be there. On the coast, the leg bones were used for making sail needles and they took the sexual organs from the men or the fetuses, unborn fetuses, and they used those, they would tie those to the sails. Now imagine if you were going to an island and you saw that. You saw bodies hanging you saw fetuses and sexual organs hanging from the mast. Would you want to stick around to fight those people? Absolutely not. So the Fijians were very, very harsh warriors. After the bete or the priest offered the bodies to the war gods, the bodies were cut up and used, uh, put in the oven using a bamboo knife. The women and children would be the last served that there was enough to eat. Fijians considered the priest's hands and lips sacred, so the attendants normally fed them. And this is what they used to eat. You can actually see these in the, uh, the museum. Sometimes they would actually take the snacks, they would take the body, they would smoke it, and then the, they would carry pieces of that body if they wanted to remember the person or if they just felt like having a smoked human snack. And uh, they would actually use the skull then from their defeated tribes to, uh, for their Yakona ceremonies. And the whole point of this is that they would inherit the knowledge and the power of the person who they were eating. Christianity did have some influence on them, but one of these missionaries actually read about, uh, read, wrote a story about a woman who tried to run, run away in the middle of the night. The husband found the woman, had his men go out and find the woman, bring her back. He had her arms cut off and then he cooked her arms and ate her arms in front of her, watch, making her watch. She died, however, right after she was baptized. And again, I spoke to you before about the Reverend Thomas Baker being the last known cannibal act. 600 government employees, including the press, attended the ceremony where, he was, where the family was given over 100 tabua. Ratu Udre Udre was the greatest cannibal in modern times. They had said that he had eaten over 9,000 people, but don't be alarmed, it was only 900. They said that they found at one point in time 872 stones, and they said that each of these stones represented one person. 
for each stone, and that his son said that he was off, his father often had a box of this smoked meat of human flesh along with him at all times, and he would never share it because he loved it so much. When you're in Fiji today, for those of you who are going to visit a Fijian village, it's important to dress conservatively. Uh, ladies, uh, you don't have to wear long pants, but make sure that you dress conservatively. Generally speaking, no tank tops. Removing your hat is important for men and women alike. Uh, wearing a hat in the presence of a chief is considered an insult. Uh, they probably won't say anything, but they will be insulted nonetheless. If you're invited into a home, be gracious and show obvious gratitude. Uh, say over and over again how beautiful their home is and how grateful you are for the invitation. Take off your shoes before entering and leave them at the door. That's important. And it's insulting to touch someone's head. Never touch anyone's head, even a child, because this is where their connection to the spirit world is. And if you touch that, you destroy the relationship between them and their ancestors. Usually they bring a small bag of kava as a thank you gift for welcoming into the village. Generally, if you're going to be going with the group, your guide will bring this kava and present it to the chief. Fijians are some of the friendliest people in the world. They'll be very happy to share with you. Be free if you see people on the streets and you want to ask them questions, feel free to ask them questions. Uh, religions is widely practiced Christian religions. You'll see Christian churches. You'll also see mosques and Sikh and Hindi temples. Uh, from a language perspective, English is learned, but most of the languages that are taught are Fijian and Hindi are the first languages, but most people that you meet will have some knowledge of English. Here's some ways to learn a few words. If you want to say hello to someone, you can say bula or bula bula. Thank you is vinaka. And if you want to say thank you very much, you say vinaka vakalevo. Yo is saying yes. And then senga is saying no. There's a few rules for language. The letter G is pronounced NG. So when you're going to be in Nandi, if you're going to be pronouncing that, you have tombero. The letter C is pronounced TH. So the Mamanutha Islands. And I've got to close with one joke. So two cannibals are sitting around in the campfire, and one says to the other, you know, I really hate my mother-in-law. And the other one says, well, just eat the vegetables then. <laughs> All right, the lights are on. It's my time, folks. Thanks very much. <laughs>